Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever else in the world you may be. Um, climate change in many of our minds is like a very slow motion nightmare and its dangers feel a bit impersonal and distant. Most of us probably think, well, I'm not really directly impacted, uh, if anything, and probably won't happen in my generation. But actually, what if it is directly impacting you and your health here right now today? Welcome to today's webinar on the intersection between climate change and health. We are joined today by Dr. Purnima Prabhakaran. She's a physician by background, has a master's in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a PhD in social medicine from the University of Bristol. After a few years in clinical practice, a short stint at the Clinical Epidemiology and Biostats Division and the Public Health of, uh, rather, Population Health Research Institute at the McMaster University in Canada, she, her interest was piqued in epidemiology and public health, after which she acquired training in this in the UK. Since 2015, Dr. Punima has led several research projects on climate change and health impact, particularly recognizing that this was missing in children's health research in India. She was instrumental in, in sensitizing the fraternity of birth control re researchers in India through training and capacity building in environmental health. She is currently additional professor, head of environmental health and deputy director for the Center for Environmental Health at the Public Health Foundation of India, where she leads a team of nearly 20 researchers. Additionally, she is a consultant at the Center for Chronic Disease Control, New Delhi, where she continues research in life course approach to chronic disease. She also leads work in engaging health sector leadership for environmental issues across India. For example, she works closely with the National Programme for Climate Change and Human Health. She also chairs the research subcommittee within the WHO Global Climate and Health Alliance CSO Working Group for Climate Change and Health. And she also teaches climate change and health courses to graduate students in India and elsewhere as part of capacity building initiatives. Dr. Purnima, welcome uh, to the webinar and thank you for being here. Thank you, Nerissa. Pleasure, pleasure is mine. We also have Dr. Neeti V. Rao, who's a health policy and system specialist with experience in research and providing technical support to state and central government and international agencies for health policy design, implementation and evaluation in India. She's a gold medalist from the University of Delhi has a PhD in biology from the University of Virginia, USA. She also, she's also associated with the Institute of Public Health, Bangalore, as a adjunct faculty member, where she continues to engage on health systems research and training. She's worked at the Azim Premji University Center for Climate Change and Sustainability in Bangalore as a postdoc researcher on environmental governance and health impacts associated with climate change. Currently, she works as an independent researcher on health and a health policy consultant. She's involved in research and advocacy issues on related to tobacco, tobacco control, managing conflicts of interest, health impact assessments, regulating the private health sector and intersectoral action for health, especially on environmental health. She also continues to engage in developing content for training on courses on topics such as good health research practices and public health advocacy. Thank you, Dr. Neeti V. Rao, and welcome to the webinar as well. Thank you, Larissa. We also have the support of our colleague, Masroor Azam, who will kindly be helping us with the technical aspects that come with hosting a webinar. And Masroor is a research fellow also at the Center for Chronic Disease Control, Sister, in Sister Organization of Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, thank you to you all. So then, Climate change, should we talk about it as a crisis or is it just fact of life? Who would like to start us off? Dr. Purnima, Dr. Neeti. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go. I can just kind of set the context maybe. If that... yeah. um, so thank you, Nerissa, and uh, hello to my co-panelist, Dr. Neeti. I've had the uh, pleasure of knowing her for a little over a year now. Uh, 
So, uh, Nerissa, I, I um, completely, um, you know, agree with the way you started uh, this discussion about uh, climate change being such an abstract concept for many people even today. Um, though it's kind of become like the buzzword, a lot of people are talking about it. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that this concept is very abstract to very many people still. Uh, so while uh, it has been stated and uh, you know it's been talked about that it is probably the biggest global health challenge of the 21st century, um, we have still a long way to go in sensitizing people about the issue as it were. Uh, so much as we talk about a very correlated environmental risk, air pollution, you know that's something more easily relatable. Uh, people are able to recognize that air quality is deteriorating. A very related and intricately linked environmental risk factor is climate change. Whether we accept it or not today, the sources are often the same. The, uh, the pollutants that cause air pollution are also the same ones that cause climate change. So there is the scope for addressing these two environmental risk factors together. There's co-benefits for health, there's co-benefits for social and economic gains all around. Um, so really, I mean, there is no two ways about it. We re really need to talk about climate change. It, it is here and it is on us now. It is a, another pandemic, just like the one that we are in the middle of right now. And it's been growing slowly on us right here in our backyard. And I think it's important, especially for us sitting here in India as uh, an issue that's going to affect the most vulnerable of the countries and India's right there up and top of the ones that are going to be most impacted. I think there was a recent World Bank report um, that looked at the global hotspots. And I think India stands way ahead in terms of impacts, um, in terms of the economics, especially. So every ton of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, India set back something like 80 US dollars and compare that uh, with what US will have, it's about half, 48 US dollars and Saudi Arabia at 47, just to give you a perspective. So really, um, not just in terms of the impacts of the acute climatic events on health, uh, there's also going to be impacts on the economy as well as the social um, dimensions of our lives here. I'll stop there. That was just to kind of ask the first question. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Neeti, could you add something to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Dr. Purnima said. I think that the term climate change itself is actually very, very familiar. All of us throw it around. Uh, but like she said, I think the pathways of how it happens, what how it really affects our lives are still relatively unknown and relatively poorly understood. I think we still think of climate change as this global issue, and of course it is. It absolutely is a you know, global issue that affects uh, you know, the whole world at global scales. Uh, and, and thanks to COVID, we've become a little bit more familiar with what that might look like. But really, it's also something that affects each one of us, uh, no matter who we are or where we live at an individual level. I mean, simple things. Uh, for example, I was reading last week in the newspaper that... Uh, you know, uh, mango farmers are worried about their mangoes this season because of unseasonal rains in February. Now, uh, these are all the sorts of things, you know, from everyday things about, you know, the pleasures of the fruits that we like and the, the foods that we like to the kind of water supply that we get. Uh, all of these you know, very everyday, ordinary things are actually affected by these global phenomena like climate change. And it's really not something that's you know, in the future, it's really here and now. And again, as Dr. Purnima said, India, uh, people here uh, should, you know, all of us should realize that actually we're right at the top of, you know, the, uh, the waiting list of how the impacts of climate change are going to play out. So it becomes that much more urgent for people here uh, for us to now think about what can be done of course, at the national level, but also at each of our individual levels. How do we educate ourselves much better? How do we understand how it really affects our lives uh, beyond just, you know, the term climate change uh, and, and, and just associating it or blaming it for everything else while considering it to be out of our control as if it's something that, you know, we can't really do anything about. Uh, hopefully, you know, as we go along this conversation, we can talk more about, you know, understanding really how it affects, particularly our health, uh, given that that's the highlight for this year, you know, in a, in a pandemic year. 
Uh, but really going forward, uh, thinking about, you know, what are all the sorts of things that, that we can do, educate ourselves better, and also what, what is it that we can do? That's great. I mean, I think that's a superb start, actually, because you've really taken it really wide. And, you know, whilst today the, the um, focus of today's webinar is health, you've also mentioned their global comparisons with consumers elsewhere in the, in the world, uh, emissions elsewhere in the world, and then also how uh, the impacts are never linear. They're never, you know, the, the same everywhere. They're going to be on a spectrum and some people are going to feel it worse than others. And, and also highlighted how, how um, India is somewhere up in that ladder in terms of, you know, we might be the first or amongst the first to impact the more severe damage and the more um, severe impacts from, from climate change. But something that I wanted to also ask you right at the outset was when we talk about uh, planetary resources or renewable resources, is, it, is there a little bit of murkiness and blurring of lines between, you know, isn't the natural habitat like uh, abundant? Why are we concerned? And what is this one degree rise that everyone talks about? Is it is it today's temperature is 32 somewhere in India, tomorrow it's 33? Or what, what is that one degree um, rise in temperature? Dr. Purnima? <laughs> yeah, I could again uh, start off if you like. Um, so yeah, I mean, this one degree rise, I think this is something that um, I think came to the fore in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was drafted, where all uh, like nations uh, subscribed to kind of committing to reduce their emissions all around. And right at the outset, I think we need to recognize that um, though everybody signed up to it, uh, Commitments obviously are not going to be at the same level, even to start with, simply because um, different countries and different regions in the world are uh, have different responsibility. Uh, some, uh, as is a well-known fact, I think the scale of development and the the uh, the rate of development has been greater in the in the Western countries and probably responsible for a big part of the emissions. But having said that, it um, uh, it also uh, um, it rings true that we in the developing country are also developing quite rapidly. So there is a need to decouple that uh, rapid urbanization and development that we are looking at, the development trajectories, while keeping in mind the emissions that they are responsible for. So we talk about the Paris Agreement uh, saying that, you know, uh, we have to keep the emissions um, below two degrees below two degrees above the pre-industrial uh, era. So there was the, uh, the previous era to that when there was a, a growth at a very slower scale and then there was the industrial growth era. So we need to keep the emissions below two degrees. And this two degrees is um, the rate of increase in temperature over decades in time. And what's happening now is because of this telescoping of growth, there is a rapid increase in the, in the global surface temperature because of the emissions coming from every which sector that you want to think about. And, and really now uh, the hardcore fact is it's not just two degrees, we really need to limit it to 1.5 degrees. So that slow increase in temperature that is happening all around the world has to be limited to 1.5 degrees. And with business as usual approach that we have, uh, unfortunately, today, uh, it's like we might reach that 1.5 degrees even uh, by tw uh, somewhere between 2030 and 2040. And really what we need to subscribe to all around um, in the form of what is known as the nationally determined contributions that countries ascribe to every year, uh, you know, in time for the uh, conference of parties that happens uh, where ministries environment come together and discuss how much of emissions they will they will decrease in their regions and increasingly we have to recognize that it's not good anymore to have this business as usual approach we have to address every sector and reduce our emissions all around industry agriculture uh, including the health sector we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this uh, session if it's possible but paradoxically so, even healthcare delivery has its own emissions. So all around, we need to reduce those emissions and keep it below 1.5 degrees. And the way it's going now, it looks like the growth and development is going to make that emissions level really high. And that's where the, we need to flag our activities. Anthropogenic sources, you know, human-induced activities are the main causes of the climate pollutants. And we really um, have to 
keep that in the radar in all our uh, commitments and our actions. Not sure if I answered you fully, Nerissa, but... No, very much so. And it's a good segue you've um, given me to uh, go into discussing now that focus on the mechanisms of how, uh, you know, human induced uh, activities are, are causing uh, impact to the environment and impact to the climate, which are then in turn impacting our health. And I wanted to come to uh, Dr. Neeti um, to start us off in that, in that space. If we take infectious diseases first as our first example, um, and then we can come to heat and air, um, how, what has climate change got to do with infectious disease? And you know, COVID, for example, now is one of the biggest examples we can talk about. Could you, could you stop, start us off? Yeah, so just to you know, add to what uh, Dr. Purnima was saying, that the uh, industrial era, we've already gone through a one degree raise in the global mean temperatures. That's, that means that human activity has already you know, affected the climate of this, uh, of this planet. And of course, we are seeing the impacts of it in many, many different ways and in infectious diseases we've known since 2007, really, when the you know, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change first looked at health impacts, uh, that climate change does have an impact on infectious diseases that actually increases the risk of infectious diseases. And particularly from the point of view of uh, those of us in India, uh, you know, we have seen actually just from uh, the reports and the incidence of various diseases that there have been many, many diseases that have actually been emerging or re-emerging after long gaps. A uh, prime example of that, uh, for example, is chikungunya, which, uh, you know, which used to be very, very rare in India until 2005, whereas now it's so common that almost every one of us listening today perhaps knows at least one person uh, you know, personally who's been affected by chikungunya. That's how uh, the trajectory of this, this one disease has changed just in the last few decades. Uh, but that's actually also true for many, many different uh, infectious diseases. I do want to, you know, clarify though that it's difficult though to directly attribute uh, the rise in infectious diseases to climate change alone. Um, it's e most of the literature and, you know, the studies that it's easier, for example, to correlate, you know, the, the pathogen, the rate of, let's say, mosquitoes uh, development in various temperatures or at various uh, humidity levels and so on. But that's not really climate. Uh, you know, we do need to make a separation between just the weather and the climatic patterns over, over a period of time, over decades, uh, like Dr. Bunema was saying. Uh, but even over decades, just from looking at the trends of how these diseases have been affected various parts of the country, we've seen that uh, you know, many of these vector-borne diseases, uh, malaria is a prime example, so is chikungunya, dengue, you know, all of these diseases that we're very, very familiar with uh, are all affected by climate change. And what has happened is that clim as climate has been changing, it's affected the transmission windows of these pathogens. So where you know, what are the locations, what are the temperature, what are the ideal conditions for these diseases to develop? That's been changing. And we've seen that the trends of the incidence of these diseases have changed. Once again, thinking of India, uh, let's say dengue, uh, just, you know, the year between the number of dengue cases that we had since uh, 2010 to 2014 was about two and a half times the number of dengue cases that we saw from 1998 to 2009. So that one decade had fewer, uh, actually two and a half times fewer cases than just five years uh, following that. So that's you know how the trends have been changing. Similarly, diseases like Kala Azar, uh, you know, we'd read about them in our uh, school textbooks and so on, and we knew that it existed in parts of Bihar and West Bengal, but now suddenly we're, you know, we're seeing it in places like Uttarakhand. Uh, we're seeing it in northeastern states. So uh, the range of these infectious diseases have been changing. Even things like malaria that you know have been has been endemic in India for a long, long time. We're seeing, for example, uh, you know, parts of North India and Central India used to be where malaria was most prominent. But now even in northeastern states, southwestern states, uh, places that had far lower temperatures and far shorter windows of when these diseases were. Uh, you know, with active, have actually increased. Uh, 
also apart from you know just the direct change in how the weather patterns and the climatic patterns really have been changing and how that affects the risk so it's important to say you know climate change also actually increases the risk of things like floods uh and uh for example when we had you know the mumbai floods in 2005 right along with it came outbreaks of you know dengue and leptospirosis similarly when uttarakhand floods happened um that's also something Uh, these sorts of you know floods and cyclones are also increasing uh, in incidence because of climate change and they are usually accompanied by uh, infectious diseases particularly and the last thing is about you know covid uh, like diseases uh, <laughs> or really zoonotic diseases that actually transfer from animals uh, and jump from animals onto human beings and again we have seen you know many more such diseases more recently uh, of course there is covid but beyond that uh, in india we've also gone through a nipah virus epidemic not so long ago just in 2019 and uh, before that there was uh, the kyasnur forest disease which is actually still uh, there are outbreaks that still occur in parts of south india uh, people are still you know affected uh, injured and dying of these diseases so really uh, again uh climate change actually impacts these risks in not just linear pathways but really in very many complex ways uh and associated with the climatic impacts are also our habits and socio cultural norms and how prepared our health system is uh, to some of these diseases how how much you know how uh, well are we able to actually tackle these diseases so all of these factors are important but climate certainly has a major role to play Thank you so much. Uh you mentioned, you know, a couple of things that I wanted to add on just an, a, a few other examples. So, for example, you mentioned how uh, the geolocation pattern of malaria is changing within India, for example. What we've noticed, you know, I'm based in the in Western Europe in the UK. Um what we've noticed is as weather patterns are changing, warmer air, you know, year on year is moving from say for example North Africa further up into the northern hemisphere and then from western europe further up into the uk even we've got swarms of mosquitoes and other vectors that are traveling with that warm air and you know being found in uh, places in countries where you wouldn't normally think of uh, such vector borne uh, diseases and potentially the diseases that come with them in those countries and uh, it was interesting you mentioned uh, covid and you know the difficulty which is absolutely true between linking climate change to uh an you know uh, a pathogen and then to a disease and then to the change in patterns and trends of these diseases i believe a, a study recently published by cambridge university has maybe perhaps they're the first to make that direct link between the amount of carbon dioxide which is in the air uh in some southeast china uh, southeast asian or east asian um countries which has changed the plant profile and the forest profile which then changes the profile of the animals and the ecosystem you know the other wildlife that um uh, habit uh, inhabits that uh, that environment which then brings you know typical or atypical pathogens which are associated with them but it's very it is you're right very difficult to make that link that direct causal causal link between you know uh carbon emissions somewhere and then change in uh, disease pattern and epidemiology somewhere else but i i think you've given some really interesting examples there that bring it home to uh, you know what we're experiencing in india uh, for example today yeah, just to say one additional thing just because you mentioned you know again how difficult it can sometimes be to make that to attribute really some of these things directly to climate change for me uh, you know regardless of whether it actually is caused by climate change or not or if there's a direct link once again as dr purnima mentioned right at the beginning many of the causal pathways uh, are actually interlinked with you know more common issues that we see you know, things like deforestation uh, pollution uh, the way we have changed the use of our land uh, many of these things actually are on their own you know in their own right really environmental issues that need to be tackled and of course they also then compound uh, the risks that are associated with climate change and really add on to it uh, and once again i think as a you know as a lay person really regardless of you know the we don't uh, regardless of the complexity associated with the technical details of climate change uh, i think our experience 
um, of these diseases. And uh, as I mentioned, how many of them have increased or moved to new parts, or again, you, know, you mentioned uh, malaria, just even the kinds of vectors. So the species, this particular species that causes malaria has actually changed in some parts of Northeastern India. So we might be targeting uh, one vector and finding that actually it's a closely related different species that's resistant, for example, to your, uh, you know, the, the uh, thing, the mosquito killer that you're using, for example. So, so all of these, you know, our experience already says that these are things to tackle urgently, regardless of whether or not the technical details of actually, you know, the attribution to climate change is established. So we need to look at the downstream effects. We need to deal with, uh, you know, environmental health issues. We need to deal with issues of forest degradation, of land use change, all of these more immediate things. Uh, which once again, they're, they're problems in their own right. I'm glad you mentioned land use change uh, because I wanted to I wanted to come to heat stress, but I, I think I'll push that back. I'll come to Dr. Purnima first about um, air, air pollution. Um, you know, you're, I think, I believe you're based in Delhi and or close to Delhi. So I'm gonna come to you about, you know, the, the forever talked about air pollution issue in the North of India and how that, how, uh, if you can explain how that might be linked to uh, anthropogenic activity, like uh, like you've mentioned, and what the impacts of that might be on infant health, on fetal health, maternal, or even you know later adult in later uh, health in adult life. Uh. Oh, it looks like um, Dr. Purnima is frozen, so I might have to come back to you, Neeti, about heat stress. <laughs> Um, I think I'll do that. Um, when we when we talk about you know the industrial age and carbon emissions, all of this is in is contributing to that one degree, one point five degree rise in temperature globally, right? Um, so, what does how does that change impact? How does heat in itself impact our health? So, I mean, again, since you mentioned 1.5 degrees, uh, and it was uh, a study really from a couple of weeks ago that said, even if we meet the Paris target of 1.5 degrees and you know, keeping it to less than two degrees global mean temperature, South Asia particularly uh, is going to continue to experience heat stress, very severe heat waves, debilitating heat waves. In fact, we're already seeing the effects of this. We're already experiencing heat waves. I think uh, that is no news to any of us here in India. Uh, we're, and South Asia particularly is a hot spot. So, the, you know, the current trajectory is, uh, actually, let me, let me you know, uh, keep the numbers to a side for a, for a bit and just talk to you about, you know, this incident once again that I read about. And uh, I think it was in 2019. Uh, and there were five people who had gone on a pilgrimage to Varanasi from Tamil Nadu. Uh, and as they were returning, these were older people, you know, about 50 years of age. And as they were returning by train, uh, I think they got the train from Agra. And by the time uh, Jhasi arrived, which is about a four hour train ride, uh, five of these people had actually passed away in the train. And one of them was uh, so critically uh, was in such a critical condition that they had to be rushed to the hospital immediately. Uh, and it was simply an effect of, you know, heat. It was heat stress that led to the death of these five people who'd simply gone on a pilgrimage. Now, this is not an isolated incident. Things like this have happened before. Uh, we have seen that just in the past decade, there have been over 6,000 deaths directly due to heat stroke uh, in India. And in 2015 alone, uh, we saw about 2,000 deaths uh, in India. And, and really, this is highly underreported. We don't even know what are all the indirect effects of, of heat uh, in India because it is, uh, we don't fully understand all of the secondary impacts. We don't understand how, uh, you know, what the proportion of people who have heat stress end up having cardiovascular diseases or how it interacts with diabetes and stroke and obesity and all of those other, uh, you know, what's called non-communicable diseases. Uh, we do know though that it affects productivity. It affects, uh, of course, particularly uh, the older people are vulnerable. 
uh, and we know that it's already here. We're already going through it. The good news on heat stress actually is that India is doing something about it. Many regions in India have now put together heat action plans, starting with uh, the city of Ahmedabad in Gujarat. Uh, and we've seen that actually development of these heat action plans do have an impact on heat stress, on the mortality associated with heat stress. Uh, but but really, heat stress is like a is like an iceberg, as somebody has said, and that only ten percent of its impacts are actually visible, and the ninety percent we still don't even fully understand. So once again, we need to think about you know broader aims. One, of course, you know strengthening the ability of our health system to respond to heat stress, uh, but beyond that, also uh, to think about you know more longer term uh, measures of how do we adapt with this you know, heat wave and heat stress conditions that is already here in most parts, of many parts of India. Really. Sorry, Dr. Purima. Thank you, Neeti. Uh, but uh, I had to jump to Neeti because your screen froze a little bit. So I'm going to bring know. you now um, on uh, air pollution. But before I do, just linking into what Dr. Neeti said, um, you know, we talk about, uh, I know when I was studying in school, we talked, we studied about ozone and, you know, chlorofluorocarbons uh, and how uh, that was, it helps to trap the heat in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't, we, I don't think at that point talked so much about ozone at ground level, which also then helps to um, uh, keep the heat, I suppose. And, you know, apart from, apart from that, it also then has an effect on, for example, the um, uh, profile of plants that are and crops that are able to survive and even grow. So uh, there was a study that did uh, that looked at uh, you know again carbon dioxide concentration in the air and how that impacted a, the crop yield and the crop quality. And in fact, they noted that um, uh, plants and crops that grew in areas with a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the air actually had a lower a lower amount of nutrients in them. So they were producing yield, but not or lower yield, but uh, and also without uh, or with lower levels of, say, for example, iron um, and protein and, and zinc in them. And then when we couple that with, um, you know, the nutrient deficiency epidemic, if I may call it, in India already, which disproportionately impacts uh, one part of society as opposed to the more affluent parts, then we are, it's like a double whammy. So one, we have people who are malnourished or nutrient deficient. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, we're causing, uh, say, from our own activities, um, hurdles to cross over our agricultural yield. And, you know, then even when we do have agricultural yield, the quality of that nutrition is low again. So it's, it's these links that I think need to be brought into, uh, you know, the common understanding amongst population that uh, to, to, to cross that, ba that uh, barrier of how is this relevant to me? And like, you know, why is this relevant to me? So Dr. Poonima, I wanted to come to you about air pollution in specific in, uh, in if you can give us the North example or any other example that you may wish. Sure, so, so just uh, to linger a moment on what you talked about just now, uh, Neeti, uh, definitely linked to these increasing temperatures and the ozone and the increasing carbon dioxide emissions is a direct link that hits right at, I should say, stomach of the country, like, you know, there is, a, India's an agrarian economy at the end of the day, it contributes to a big chunk of our D, uh, GDP, and um, and a lot of our uh, working populations, are, it, 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 it's a lot of opportunities that come from the agricultural sector for India. So I think certainly the increasing temperatures have impacted crop production, not just in terms of the gross production. So the crop produce uh, is affected. So it's right, right away hitting at the food security of the nation, but also in terms of, you know, the rapid crop maturation affecting the nutrient uh, content of the crop. So you were quite right in terms of staples like rice, maize, uh, wheat, soya bean, as well as you know the content with, uh, like in terms of iron or zinc or proteins, the right way it affects the nutrition security of the country as well. So um, an indirect impact like you um, in passing mentioned was that it impacts the cost of you know the fruits and vegetables and then you're moving people to the you know along the spectrum to uh, going towards processed foods. 
So there is this term called the global syndemic, you know, which is like three pandemics together. On the one hand, you still have undernutrition in India. On the other hand, you have overweight and obesity sinking into the into our um, arena. And there is the other pandemic of climate change. So these three pandemics together, it's called the global pandemic. So right away, there is a need for moving to, you know, climate smart uh, agricultural systems and climate less resource intensive. Um, and um, yes, I, I think nutrition and food security is a big uh, uh, impact of climate change. Uh, so coming to air pollution, uh, yes, so sitting in the hotspot for air pollution, uh, I live in the Delhi NCR region, most talked about uh, it's a dining room discourse now to talk about air pollution, uh, not just for academics or technical experts, but even um, you know, uh, the lay community, moms. We have a group called Warrior Moms, I think, who, who talk about the impacts of air pollution on their children and are be being the real activists on the ground. For that. So yes, I think air pollution is, I think, top of the table risk factor now for health impacts of air pollution. Uh, I've seen around the world, but more so in India, like WHO, I think, 14, 15 of 20 most polluted cities are in India. And um, it's, it's, it's really bad news, but recognizing the importance of um, air pollution, um, I think the UN at the highest level uh, included air pollution as a risk factor for non-communicable diseases. And uh, not just non-communicable diseases, I think we are very much aware that um, in India, for sure, um, the average uh, citizen, uh, the, uh, the exposure to the particulate matter, the PM 2.5, which is the most talked about pollutant so far as air pollution is concerned. There are others, not to discount the sulfur dioxide, the NOx, no, nitrous oxide, the, the volatile organic compounds, uh, but particulate matter 2.5, uh, I think average exposure is something in the range of 90 micrograms uh, per meter cubed. And if you compare that to what the WHO air quality guideline is, it is 10. 10 micrograms. And uh, even if we go with our national air quality um, uh, standards, which is 40, we are on an average more than twice um, uh, that level of exposure. So going by those guidelines, if you go with the WHO guidelines, 99% of our districts are um, you know, the, the mandated uh, levels of air pollution, uh, air quality guidelines. And if we go by our own national standards, it's uh, at least 60% of our districts. And so we really have a lot of work to do there in terms of the ambient air pollution. Um, and uh, I want to also flag here, we talk a lot about the ambient air pollution and that comes from very many sectors. We've talked about um, fossil fuel combustion as the biggest culprit. We are still a country that uh, depends a lot on coal-fired thermal power plants for our energy mix. So fossil fuel combustion is a big, big source of our air pollution. Uh, apart from that, in Delhi in particular, there have been various sectors that have been pinpointed as the source of uh, vehicle pollution. Uh, there's road and construction dust. Um, there's industrial sector. There's lots of emissions that come from those sectors. But I also want to flag for the whole of Northern India, there's a big proportion that comes from indoor air pollution. It's not talked about as much as it should be, but indoor air pollution causes as uh, much, you know, like uh, 1.2 million deaths is the figure that we say in India from air pollution. Uh, about 6 million is from ambient air pollution, but a good chunk, almost 0.5 million is from indoor air pollution related deaths. And the, the harming, um, I think the alarming statistic is that a good chunk of the premature mortality occurs in people less than 70 years of age. So our demographic dividend, our working populations are directly affected. And uh, uh, almost uh, two years of our life expectancy is affected by air pollution. So we have a lot to do there. I mean, we do have programs at national level and subnational levels to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, work on air pollution. But I think the important part is to bring health into all of those discourses. And uh, your question on what are the health impacts, intuitively we think it should be the respiratory morbidity and mortality uh, because we are breathing the air. So uh, and chronic respiratory infections and bronchitis, pneumonia, but also exacerbations of asthma at extremes of age, children, the elderly, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and even lung cancer. So apart from the impacts on the respiratory system, increasingly there's evidence now to show that there are impacts on the cardiovascular system. So heart attacks, strokes, um, uh, it's become now the top of the table risk factor as well, air pollution for cardio cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, not to forget 
um, the exposure that pregnant women have to air, a polluted air, there's increasing evidence base now to show the impacts on birth outcomes. So ranging from, uh, you know, just lowered birth weight, stillbirths, premature mortality, and even going on into a later life, like the neonatal morbidity from uh, exposure during pregnancy, uh, anthropometric indicators, stunting, wasting, if they've all been documented now uh, to be related to exposure to air pollution during different periods of the pregnancy. Um, I think there's a lot to be done in terms of increasing that evidence base for India. There's often discourse around, we are basing our policies around you know, uh, health studies that have happened in the West. Uh, but I think there's a lot being done now in India in that area as well. So increasing number of studies that are documenting very many health outcomes of following exposure to it. Indoor That's as well. That's so true. And it's interesting you said that at the end, because I was going to bring in an example from China, um, a study on, on birth weight from China, uh, which happened uh, around the 2008 Olympics. And uh, what happened, uh, what they did was, uh, you know, the international focus is on the country at that time. So I, th I believe the Chinese government um, sort of reduced uh, industrial activity, reduced road activity, road transport and traffic activity. So what happened was that the um, pollution in the air notably decreased during that, that year before and after um, the Olympics. And what research, uh, researchers noticed was that actually even that short intervention of a couple of years or a year before and after the, the Olympics, uh, birth weight for children and for maternal outcomes actually increased. Mm -hmm. With, uh, you know, longer term programs later on in life and, uh, and predisposes you to ill health um, later on in, 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 life, in life. So I, th I found that really interesting because, you know, sometimes... We problem but the the intervention is also going to span 15 years or 10 years but it's good to see these studies that actually show short-term interventions also having an impact and 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 it's useful for that to be to then be taken into account into any of our sort of local or subnational um plans that we have for air pollution the other thing i wanted to make uh, the link between uh, you know we've talked about we've talked about air pollution um, I wanted to mention uh, the link between our groundwater table and then also air pollution. So I understand from talking to another environmental scientist, people uh, has, I believe, decreased, you know, when we think about intensification of droughts and intens intensification of um, uh, monsoons and the extremes of that, the impact that has on the agricultural sector. So I understand that in the state of Punjab, somewhere around 2009, there was a law introduced that you couldn't plant your crop before June. So the rice crop couldn't be planted before, I think it's the rice, a rice crop, um, before June. But because farmers were used to doing two rotations within a year, um, their growing season was um, shortened from June to, till autumn time. So in order to get over that very short period between the first crop and the second crop, what I understand has become the agricultural practice now is double burning. And that then, uh, you know, contributes, is another contributing factor to, to the air pollution in the northern, northern uh, states, which are, you know, large proportions of which are agricultural uh, industries. Is, is that, does that sound right to you? Does that chime with your experience as well, Dr. Purnima and Dr. Neeti perhaps? Yeah, I mean, you're quite right uh, about, you know, going back to the history of why this learning started, uh, you're quite right. I think that's what, there was a law that was passed about this, uh, you know, taking cognizance of the water table decreasing. So this stubble burning now um, is something that is here and now, and it's happening and is being regularly attributed to as a cause for the air pollution, the pollutants being transmitted uh, over, over uh, regions and being one of the major causes for the uh, deteriorating air quality in Delhi every winter. Um, yeah, and there's lots of uh, programs and policies that are being done apart from, you know, actual on the ground behavior change communication to farmers. But, you know, it, it can't just take one. Uh, it's not a one size fits all. It's got to be different approaches. And uh, there's very many uh, ways or uh, strategies that are being taken to address this issue on the ground um, from, you know, giving them better practices for managing 
repurposing the stubble maybe rather than just burning them and you know in situ kind of um, the harvesting of the crop um, there are very many strategies that are going on apart from actually learning from you know in person consultations with the farmers on why they do do it and i think it also takes political will at the highest level to change some of the policies and make that happen but yes i think stubble burning has been um, an issue and uh, it's one one of the reasons there is very many um, factors for pollution in delhi at least yeah. And to me, actually, this, you know, sorry to interrupt, but just what you said, there is a, uh, you know, about this connection between the agricultural practices of farmers, which in turn are in fact influenced by the agricultural policies of privileging rice and wheat, uh, you know, the hard grains, and therefore incentivizing uh, agriculturalist farmers across the country to be growing rice, even in regions which are not as water secure uh, as you know, rice is a highly water intensive uh, crop. Uh, and then how it then intersects with something like air pollution. I think this is actually a classic example for me of how all of these things, even though we sort of just like uh, in this, even in this webinar, we went to one issue after another, you know, sectorally or individually as issue by issue, but really this is just one really big continuum. All of these things are related. Uh, and therefore, what we need to do, of course, it's, it's you know, it can be uh, too big, uh, right, like we said right at the beginning, to think about all of them together. But we do need to know that every little thing that we do actually impacts not just any one thing, but really this whole pathway, this really whole series, this complex web of pathways, uh, and how they intersect with each other. That's true for uh, what we do as individuals. What we do as institutions and of course at the policy levels you know what we do as governments and companies and corporations and so on uh and and hopefully we'll talk you know a little bit more about uh, how all of those things actually matter a great deal at every level uh and and you know, as much as we do need to understand each of those individual impacts um on things like air pollution, on nutrition, like you rightly pointed out, on heat stress, on agriculture, on soil, on land use. Uh, they're in fact, you know, uh, they're all interrelated uh, and that's how they need to be dealt with. Thank you for that. I, th I think, you know, we should probably now talk about the group that um, might face the worst outcomes. Um, from the from the risk factors that we've been talking about, the vulnerable communities and communities perhaps displaced by impacts of climate change. Um, and I wanted to draw you in about talking about, you know, both the positive and the negative impacts of such hum human intervention on what we call progress, um, which is never felt equally across the population, as I think I alluded um, earlier, in quite in, instead quite disproportionate impact is observed between population groups. Um, I, would you like to, you know, either one of you make a start on elaborating how uh, vulnerable communities feel this impact disproportionately? Yeah, I think, again, uh, you know, right at the beginning, we mentioned how India is one of those countries that are uh, right at the top of the table. But really, if you look at it from a global level, uh, not only the impacts of climate change being much more felt in you know, many, for example, coastal countries, which are seeing a faster sea rise, uh, and therefore, and coastal regions even within India who are uh, at the real, very real risk of being submerged. Uh, but also from a point of view of just being able to tackle some of these challenges. I mean, clearly, uh, the, the ability of you know, those who are better off, who have more resources in terms of money, but also expertise and just people and the capacity to tackle some of these challenges is far greater among uh, some of the better off countries, you know, the more developed countries. And the same principle really applies even as you go subnationally. Uh, so if it, within India, for example, uh, of course, the coastal regions are very much affected by problems like the sea level rise by loss of uh, you know, fishery related or uh, sea uh, food related occupations. Similarly, there's far greater stress on, you know, so ice melt and snow melt uh, in the Himalayan regions, northeastern uh, and the western Ghats, for example, which are highly biodiverse regions and uh, these ecosystems 
uh, the the uh, forests in these regions really sustain ecosystem the mangroves similarly are all key ecosystems that sustain the climatic patterns of our country and uh, disturbances again once again to you know talk about the kinds of things that we discussed you know deforestation land use change migration all of these things urbanization these are all things that impact these ecosystem and in turn our uh, climatic uh, patterns and the people living in these regions are going to be disproportionately impacted. We already know just from lived experience that many of, you know, for example, our domestic workers uh, in places like Bangalore, where I'm located, but really in every city, every big metropolitan city in India, tend to come from some of these regions which are seeing distress, environmental distress, which is leading people to migrate out of their hometowns. Uh, so there are uh, going to be people who are living in these regions, geographical locations, which are disproportionately impacted. And similar, and also, uh, you know, just like with the richer countries, uh, those who are better off amongst us, you know, more educated, uh, more well off economically, are better poised to be able to deal with these challenges. You know, when people uh, are still worrying about you know, where they're going to get their next meal, they're hardly likely to be thinking about, you know, climate change. Uh, so, so definitely the vulnerabilities are disproportionate. And we've seen, again, once again, we've had a live run of it with uh, COVID-19 in that every one of us is susceptible to the virus, but really some of us are more uh, in danger. And that trend continues with climate change. And that's, uh, again, something to bear in mind when we think about what needs to be done, uh, again, at the policy level or at institutional levels or at individual levels. Thank you. Dr. Purnima, would you like to add something to that? Um, just to say, like, uh, I think when we talk about vulnerabilities, uh, maybe we can look at it from different lens. So one is in terms of the age itself. So extremes of age, like, you know, the children and the elderly. Um, and we also talk about pregnant women as a vulnerable group. So we could look at impacts that occur at in these age groups uh, in terms of age and, you know, just the demography. Uh, but also in terms of the socioeconomic strata. So I think uh, Niti alluded to that a bit, but, you know, we have seen like right in the middle of the pandemic how it's the lower levels of socioeconomic strata, not just because of uh, you know, poorer access to uh, the resources that they need to, you know, just live a daily uh, life, but, you know, even access to health care. There's huge health inequity as well in terms of access to healthcare. So th that is another important lens that we can look at it from, apart from the geography. So in, in terms of like, you know, coastal communities and, and what we call the climate refugees in a sense, I think that that's a term that is becoming more uh, and more used now. Uh, people moving because of the impacts of climate change in their, uh, in their indigenous locations and that uh, leading to climate conflicts in a sense. So oftentimes they are displaced from their homes and that leads to conflict, not just because of their displaced homes, but also in terms of, again, access to food, access to health care and to conflict in a sense. And I think that's a huge link back to what it can do for our mental health. Uh, I don't want to not mention mental health. I think what it does, um, uh, you know, just uh, the impacts of climate change uh, on mental health are from um, very many lens, like, you know, just in terms of anxiety, um, there's climate anxiety, eco-anxiety is a term that we are all becoming more and more familiar with. Uh, apart from that, you know, uh, the actual uh, sense of anxiety from what the environmental impacts are doing to your health and very existence. So I think the impacts on mental health also come from post-climatic uh, events and climatic events, whether it's floods, droughts, um, <clears throat> uh, post-floods or, uh, you know, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder. I think there's huge... Uh, uh, space there that needs attention um, and uh, I, I think we've got a lot to do in the space of mental health and climate anxiety, eco-anxiety as it were. Thank you. I'm, I'm keen to move us on to the, you know, the final section of our, of our webinar where we want to talk about policy and what we can do between sectors, intersectors and subnational and national level or in, international level as well. But before I do, I just wanted to add one more bit about, you know, communities, indigenous communities. The other day I was listening to a talk by um, someone called Dr. Asif Siddiqui. Uh, I hope I've got his name right, who mentions, um, you know, uh, in, in this uh, energy transition that we're all in, 
uh, mm-hmm. some faster than others, some countries faster than others. We have both, right? So in India, we are still complementing uh, our traditional energy use, fossil fuel use, with starting to use new renewable energy. And in both ways, we've got the need for infrastructure development. So whether we're still using or building new cow, uh, power plants or we're using um, you know, grids and new solar farms, there is something else that comes in the mix, which is this, what he describes, Dr. Uh, Asif Siddiqui d- describes, something called the violent logic of location. So where, um, and it's a form of, I suppose, infrastructural violence where we, uh, you know, as part of, uh, under the guise of development or what we understand as development, we choose on the scientific and technical basis locations for either road infrastructure or rail infrastructure or solar farm infrastructure or power generating, you know, nuclear plant infrastructure. But then what happens to the communities in those spaces? And I think that's another group that perhaps often gets overlooked uh, when we talk about, um, you know, massive migration between not only urban and rural, but also as a result of this yet another anthropogenic, um, you know, activity so to speak, which is often lost in the discourse and also lost in the history and the record of these uh, events um, at times, which I just wanted to mention. So thank you so much for talking about the mental health as well. Uh, We did have a webinar on mental health and um, uh, the environment late last year. Actually, it was on um, World Mental Health Day. And that video is also available for people to watch if they're interested. Um, So if I may then move you on to, you know, the policy landscape in India and what we can do, what uh, what is the role of different stakeholders and um, especially the health sector, as this is a webinar focused on health. Is it expensive to fix climate change? Do we should we talk think about it in that way? And I wonder, you know, Dr. Purnima, I'll come to you first, if you could talk us through maybe the political economy of green energy in India and where we are in that energy transition. So I, I think just to uh, drill it down to the energy thing, you uh, you were right that you know that, that we are still a very fossil fuel dependent economy, and and that hasn't changed much in recent times. Uh, we, it still contributes to a good part of the energy mix, and though having said that, we also host the International Solar Alliance in India. Way back, team, I think uh, India stepped up and said that we would host the International Solar Alliance. So some. 120 countries having signed up and uh, most of them countries in the, um, you know, the tropics between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn and then contributing to bringing the repository of solar power. And I think India is leading the way in that we have like something like 42 solar parks. I think where you're sitting in Karnataka, we have the maximum number of solar parks and there is a steady increase in the solar power as well. And I think transit renewable energy is becoming increasingly recognized as, as, Dr. Purnima seems to have frozen for me. Has that happened to you as well, Neeti? Yes, yes. Do you want to jump in at this point and then we'll continue? Yeah. Oh, no, she's back. She's back. (laughs) Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening there. But, but, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's great. Yes, please carry on. Yeah, so, so just to say that, you know, while we are still cognizant of the fact that, you know, the coal, um, the fossil fuel combustion is also a very sensitive area because it is also uh, re- uh, related to livelihoods of people working in that industry. So while we do talk about coal phase down and phase out uh, in the coming years, we have to be talking about alternate livelihoods for a big chunk of our population. There's huge coal communities out there. So while we transition to renewable energies, we also need to not just a phase out, it will have to be a transitioning from a phase down to a phase out of coal power plants. But renewable energy, there's a huge, huge scope for it now. And I think we're talking about transitioning to clean energies, not just solar, also wind and uh, water, hybrid forms of energy. And I think there's a lot of scope in, in, even at the level of the policy making. Uh, the post COVID recovery pack. Uh, transitioning to clean energy. Uh, though the phasing out is not happening as rapidly as we would like it to, there is a big uh, focus on um, you know enhancing our solar power, and I think that's a, a good sign of transitioning to clean, clean and green energy in India. So, um, 
Um, does that? Yeah, no, thank you very much, um, Dr. Purnima. You broke up a little bit in there, but I think you came back quick enough for us to get the gist of what you were saying. <laughs> Um, Dr. Neeti, would you like, you, I think you wanted to come in at some point. No, I was just saying that, you know, lest we cause too much eco-anxiety, we should uh, make sure to reassure that actually there's quite a bit of good news and that there is action happening. Of course, there's still a lot more to do. I think in all of the issues that we discussed, you know, right from infectious diseases to heat to nutrition, uh, there's actually, you know, movement at the policy level in India. These are issues that are recognized. Uh, I think actually Dr. Purnima was part of the committee that uh, set up the National Action Plan on Climate Change and Health. I'll let her tell you more about it. Uh, so, but there is a plan to deal with each of these issues. There is recognition at the policy level that this is happening. In fact, states now have uh, started to come up with their own versions of each of these aspects. Uh, there is a lot of momentum, even at the level of, uh, you know, municipal levels and the panchayats and so on, who are beginning to recognize uh, if at least, uh, you know, starting from the term climate change, but also, like I said, you know, the lived experience of many of these changes that they are undergoing. We talked about, you know, farmers uh, in uh, Punjab and stubble burning and how this is affecting them. So even uh, through these local issues that are affecting communities and individual groups of people, uh, I think climate change is being uh, dealt with or in, in some, in one form or the other. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, again, I'll let Dr. Purnima focus uh, on the policy level. But also, I do want to say that it is it isn't something that necessarily we can say, you know, the governments are going to handle this. Uh, going right back to this conversation, in the beginning of this conversation, we said it affects each one of us. So it's time, I hope actually through this conversation, all the people that are hearing also feel motivated uh, that it isn't just you know, some government's problem. It isn't that just the conference of parties and this Paris Agreement and all these global movements. Uh, and some, you know, other others, other people's problem, but really their own and take initiative in their own communities, in their own lives, in their own uh, professions. Uh, hope, I, I mean, that's something that uh, I think is increased, no matter how much, how many things the governments do, at the end of the day, it does come down to what, how communities behave, how communities react. Great. And what about the role of the health sector then? You know, uh, we've talked about the role of the consumer, which is us day to day. We've talked about government and policy making. What about the role of the health sector? Why is it important for, you know, health professionals to be talking about uh, climate change? Yeah, actually, there are two ways that, you know, health, the health sector is thinking about. And I think uh, some parts of it, uh, I'll let Dr. Purnima go into more detail, but really very broadly, one is, like we mentioned, you know, as the health sector, what are the contributions in terms of emissions that we're making to this global climate change problem? Uh, and how can we minimize that? How can we minimize the emissions coming out of uh, the health sector? And there are things like the usage of renewable energy, uh, you know, solarification of uh, uh, some of our health facilities and so on. Uh, so that's one lens to look at it. The second is, you know, what we've spent most of our time talking about in that climate change is already having an impact on human health. How do we now adapt to it? How, what do we do in terms of preparedness uh, to build resilience, to make sure that we can handle all of the health effects that come in? Uh, so those are the two sort of broad lenses. And I'll, I mean, I'll let Dr. Purnima uh, get into some of these details and maybe add a little bit more after that. Uh, thank you, Neeti. <clears throat> so yes, to answer your question, there is on <clears throat> the role of the health sector in climate change. I think it is this two-pronged kind of these two pillars of uh, preparedness and adaptation of the health sector, recognizing that there's increasing burden of uh, climate-related climate, climate related, um, uh, diseases that are going to be on us soon. And so there is a need for <clears throat> the health sector to be prepared for that, to handle the increasing disease burden. So that is the aspect of um, you know, a resilient health sector, which is able to adapt and prepare for that response. Uh, uh, it's very commonly said that should be uh, the health facility should be the last building standing. 
Uh, and I was recently corrected on that statement. It should not be the last building standing on, alone. It should also be the last building standing and functioning. So you know, operational healthcare facility that is resilient to the effects of acute climatic events is, is about the preparedness of the healthcare sector. Um, and also be cognizant, healthcare actors can only come into action if they are aware of what is the impending disease burden. So there is a lot of capacity needs to be done even for the health sector. And uh, just while on that, I will tell you that uh, it is still not part of the medical curriculum even, climate change, let alone climate change, not even air pollution for the longest time. We uh, didn't have air pollution in my medical curriculum when I studied. So things are uh, changing and I think uh, it's important that capacity building of the healthcare sector. And the second component, the pillar of um, the, uh, the role of health sector is about the mitigation. So greening healthcare facilities is an important component. Uh, so recent work has shown that uh, all the health, if all the healthcare facilities in the world were to be put together and ranked along with countries, we would be the fifth uh, largest emitter. So the emissions from the health sector is close to 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's kind of being broken down now in a second report that's due to be released actually next week. Where you know we talked, we are talking about the healthcare sector emissions in at least seventy countries, and talking about the need for becoming environmentally sustainable in the way we use our energy, the way we use our resources, water, energy, our buildings itself. Use you know um, sustainable material for building our um, you know our structures. Uh, apart from the way we manage our um, waste. Uh, healthcare waste management is is a big also a big culprit for emissions from the health sector, and, and uh, really if we talk about different uh, components of healthcare sector emissions, uh, it's said that uh, there is the direct emissions from healthcare uh, delivery that is responsible for one component. There is the use of energy in healthcare operations, which is responsible for the second component, what we call the scope one and the scope two emissions of the greenhouse gas protocol. We don't need to get into the technicalities of that. But the biggest chunk of the carbon footprint of healthcare sectors from the supply chain, which speaks to the entire, you know, the manufacturers and suppliers of drugs, pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, the transport of not just all of the supplies, but also patient transport, uh, doctors and the nurses commute, all of the transport sector as well has a huge footprint. And at the end of the life cycle, the disposal of all those used pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, and a disposal of our waste, of our food that we uh, use and procure in the healthcare facilities. So there's a huge footprint of, healthcare sector, uh, of the healthcare sector as, as well. And these two pillars of climate preparedness or adaptation or resilience, as it were, and the mitigation that are together now talked about as you know, climate smart healthcare. The concept of climate smart healthcare speaks to these two concepts of resilience and um, mitigation. I think we have, uh, I don't know if you wanted me to talk about the policy itself now, but uh, in India, we do have the Ministry of Health uh, spear this program for the national, uh, you know, program for the climate change and human health. Uh, it, it was part of the national health mission, which was articulated in only in 2015. So it, uh, just to take a step back, it was in 2008 that the Prime Minister's Council for Climate Change articulated eight missions, and there was no health within that. It was only in 2015 that the National Health Mission was constituted and then <clears throat> going forward the National Programme for Climate Change and Human Health. So there's a huge uh, push there now to develop a national level implementation framework for um, health adaptation plans at the national level, but also building it down to a decentralized action at the state level. So states are developing as well contextualized uh, state action plans for climate change and human health. And a big component of that is about the health sector, the green and climate resilient healthcare facilities. Um, and we are uh, happy to be the center of excellence within the national program working with the ministry on that component. I'll stop there. Great, I think it's excellent that you mentioned uh, that uh, policy the, and, the, and the action plan linking both human health and climate change. Um, although relatively, you know, new uh, or recent, it's, I think, a fantastic step in the right direction. And I'm also really um, pleased that you mentioned uh, procure the procurement side and the supply chain of, you know, we talked about the health sector here, but similarly, I guess, with other sectors as well, 
you know, uh, more attention perhaps can be brought into the environmental impact of our supply chains and business in both the private sector as well as the public sector. Uh, and that can be talked about in, when we talk about interventions. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So I want to give you the opportunity in case I haven't prompted you through my questions, if there's anything else you wanted to add on the subject um, that we haven't discussed so far. I, I think I would just like to say that, you know, while we have, a, you know, climate change and health program within the Ministry of Health, um, there is, uh, you know, way back, I think the Ministry of Environment, Forest and climate Change, climate change is considered like an environment issue. So they did have a national uh, uh, program for climate change. Um, and now we have the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, which has its own uh, program uh, for the climate smart cities. So. Um, my angst has always been that there are these words. So there's the health ministry, there is the environment ministry, and there is a different ministry that's talking about climate smart cities. And they need to talk to each other, basically. So, you know, rather than work in those silos, I think it's important. So the climate smart cities did not have a health component. Now they do. Uh, uh, we are their health partners. Uh, the national uh, action plan for climate change that initially was articulated by the Ministry of Environment also did not talk about health very much the national clean air plan of the ministry of environment did not talk initially about health so now really there's a strong push by people like the health advocates like us who who need to join hands and bring that intersectoral coordination i think that is key one is uh, really the intersectoral coordination that needs to happen to make all these the ministry of renewable energy sometimes talk about bringing solar power to the healthcare facilities at the lowest level, but you know they should be working with the Ministry of Health as well. So I, I think um, that's my uh, bottom line. I think that there's a lot of good things happening in our country to, uh, you know, just to work to move the needle for climate change action. But I think intersectoral coordination is something that I would really like to see. Yeah, and related to that, uh, actually, just continuing from, from where Dr. Purnima has left off, for me personally, I, I see that actually a lot of the action, a lot of the action on climate change particularly happens top down. So it's the government of India. All of these initiatives uh, are central initiatives, were very you know, useful, but really starting from you know, the, at the government of India level and dictating to the states and to the local levels. For me, actually, uh, again, absolutely seconding what uh, Dr. Purnima has just said about intersectoral coordination. I mentioned this before, that actually all of these issues are related and therefore need to be dealt in a much more holistic fashion. The thing that gives me comfort is actually at the level of you know, the uh, immediate local governments, the municipalities, the panchayats, they are already having to you know, deal with these issues as intersectoral issues. So it's, for example, you know, the same uh, municipal corporation, let's say in Mumbai, who's uh, looking at, uh, who also runs health facilities, who's also responsible for waste management and sewage disposal, who's also responsible for uh, getting us, you know, pipe water uh, and making sure that it's clean. So, so all of these sort of immediate issues that deal with, uh, that, that immediately affect individuals and communities are being dealt at the local levels in an intersectoral fashion. Of course, much more needs to be done administratively to improve those intersectoral processes, to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, how much resources they have, how much thought goes into it, how much capacity they have. All of those things absolutely we need to work on. Uh, also, I think that there needs to be much more sort of awareness and empowerment of the important role of these you know, downstream institutions. And really, we need to start thinking of climate change, uh, mitigation as well as adaptation much more, you know, instead of this top-down fashion, but really bottom-up. Uh, so to that end, I think, uh, you know, all of us, what should we as individuals do, which is sort of my uh, finishing thought really, uh, is one, that we, we as individuals, as, no matter who we are, we really need to educate ourselves better. What is this climate change? We need to actively look for information, uh, particularly on climate change, there's a lot available. Uh, so let's find out more and also how it affects us. Two, let's engage much more with our local governments, whether it is the panchayat, whether it is the ward committee, whether it is you know in cities, 
uh, let's go vote in mayoral elections uh, in addition to and the municipal elections in addition to the state and the central elections for example let's uh, participate much more in residents welfare associations and communities and so on and three a final point a non technical point is really to build solidarity i think as much as climate change is a technical issue uh, it's also uh, there's also a lot of values that come in about what needs to be done what's right what should be done what shouldn't be done uh, for example narissa you mentioned how there are you know large for example solar power plants or big infrastructure projects that we think in the grand scheme are actually going to minimize climate change and perhaps they do but in the process end up affecting communities who used to live there so there are all of these issues and these value judgments that need to happen about what's right to do and what's not uh, and these are all things that we can't uh, you know governments can't decide independently these are things that we need to engage with and uh, i think building solidarity within where we live within the communities with amongst our neighbors and also among people that we don't necessarily uh you know who are not exactly like us who are maybe different from us i think that's extremely important uh, in crisis situations and we've seen this again with uh, covid-19 and that's going to be important uh, in an ongoing fashion for climate change absolutely given the scale of the crisis but really for uh, a vast variety of really daily life and i think that's something that each one of us can do we don't have it doesn't take any money uh so so that's really sort of my parting thought uh is that we need to build much more solidarity among people and communities i think that's a beautifully you know i think you've put the la- that bit so beautifully um i often i i do think when we're faced with these uh, you know media headlines of this is happening and then so and so has re- reacted in this way but we must go ahead because it's good for us etc the value judgments that you mentioned i think is really really important because whose perspectives are we considering when we make those um value judgments and also you know when we participate in our in our de- democratic uh, processes our responsibility doesn't just end as soon as we cast the vote right so we've participated in our national elections in our state elections whatever they may be but there are we are um, responsible for engaging in our local processes like you mentioned at the community level at the ward level at the ccp level at the you know municipality level whatever it may be even the uh, housing association level i think uh, making sure that your input is captured and your input is heard is a role that you can't we can't just expect somebody to come and ask us it's also our duty as citizens to to take it out there um and put it out there so i think i think you've put it probably better than i have so thank you for doing that um it actually also answers one of the questions that came up from one of our audience members today about uh you know how much development do we really need and what is development whose definition of development are we following are we following the the definition that was perhaps handed down if i can say handed down to us from colonial times from industry from the industrial age or is it our local indigenous uh definition that we must arrive at through conversation with our local communities and our citizens so i think that's really really important um again i'm just conscious on time so um is there anything further you would like to add before i move to my closing remarks um dr punima as dr neeti has just spoken uh no i mean i completely agree with neeti i think there is like the oh no <laughs> no let's like dr puni was frozen just at the end oh there you've just come back so we missed what you said dr puni mark if you can summarize quickly for us <laughs> yeah oh, i no. didn't find uh, oh wow <laughs> go ahead go ahead we can hear you now Yeah just to say that yes I completely agree with what Neeti said I think you know why the top down approach is fine I think a really participatory approach at the ground level and bringing together communities leaving no one behind I think that is what is about building back fairer and better and and healthier I think I completely endorse that So then um if I may with your permission um you know given today's conversation we might argue that actually 
the definition that we most hear about health, the WHO definition, which talks about race, religion, political belief, socioeconomic condition or status, is perhaps missing an acknowledgement of the intersection between environmental health um, and human health and in, an attainment of human health. For which I think on this occasion, I would like to turn you to the definition of planetary health um, as per the final report of the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, which states it's actually about the achievement of the highest attainable standard of health, well-being and equity worldwide through the judicious attention to human systems that is political, economic and social that shape the future of, many human of, of humanity and many of the Earth's natural systems that define in safe environment limits within which humanity can flourish. So before we can close, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to both today's speakers, Dr. Punima and Dr. Neeti for your valuable insight, for offering us your valuable time and expertise towards the promotion of a greater understanding amongst, of, amongst us all uh, of the intersections between human health and environmental health in the here and now, you know, not just sometime in the future. And also, I should mention uh, Mr. Masroor Razam, who has quietly but efficiently been supporting this um, webinar in the background. If we were in the same room as we usually do, perhaps I'd offer you a potted plant instead of the usual bouquet of cut flowers. Um, and, you know, perhaps that might in a very small way go towards uh, some way towards greening or regreening the plant, planet, as we say, just a tiny little bit. But in this virtual world, I hope you'll accept a thank you from me, a virtual thank you, and my sincerest gratitude for your time this afternoon. Um, and before we go, I'd like to present the audience with this quote by someone called Wendell Berry from uh, The Long-Legged House in 1969. We've lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for the world. We've been wrong. We must change our lives so that we'll, it'll be possible to live by the contrary assumption. What is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and learn what is good for it. With that, if I may, I will take your leave. Um, thank you once again and stay safe. Thank you, Nerissa. It was a pleasure being part of this session. The pleasure's all mine. Thank you both. Yeah, this was really great. Thank you both, uh, Nerissa, as well as Dr. Uh, Funima. Uh, it was really lovely to learn from both of you, actually. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll hear much more from all the people who are attending as well. Oh, Thank I should you. say that the, the webinar has, has been recorded. So if you haven't had a chance to join us live just now, then you will have a chance to see the recorded version. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank you, Niti, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roor, as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nerissa, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.